Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And the most important part about the book we're going to talk about today is the subtitle. And the subtitle is A Sword Boat Captain Returns to the Sea. And the title of the book is Seaworthy. The author who is with us is Linda Greenlaw. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me. And incidentally, the publisher is Viking. The uh, This is going to be a book about sword fishing, okay? And I found it so darn educational, and I'll tell you why. To me, sword fishing is two overweight guys on a very expensive yacht sailing out of the Keys. And then the next thing you know about them, they're on shore holding a huge swordfish up and it's getting weighed. And I always think it's been caught by one of the crew. But that's not your sword fishing, is it? No, although that sounds like something I'd like to try. <laughs> no, uh, that's that's uh, far, far from what I've been doing for the last uh, many years. The other thing that you've been doing for the last many years, you've been a very, very productive author. You've written... Uh, a, a, a book that uh, was very famous called The Hungry Ocean. Another book that was, I guess, a bestseller, The Lobster Chronicles. And then I read in the notes here that you've always, you also run off a couple of mysteries, which were bestsellers, and the greatest achievement of all, co-authored a cookbook with her mother, Martha. Wow. What was the title of the cookbook? Recipes from a Very Small Island. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. Um, Seaworthy's book number seven for me, and I never would have Ooh. imagined that I, uh, you know, would have written even one book. So it's, you know, I'm still pinching myself about this uh, author thing. <laughs> the Very Small Island is in Maine? Yes, it is. It's Idaho, and it's off the coast of Maine. Thank you for saying it, because every time I read it, I said, I don't really know how to pronounce this. Idaho. Yes, the locals say Idaho. Some of the summer people say Idaho. It's French for High Island. Okay. And you were there uh, having uh, what was a, you know, a fairly productive and relative to what you were about to do, peaceful existing existence. You were catching lobsters. You'd yeah. set out your nets or whatever every day. And what happened? Yes, fishing lobster traps. And uh, I had been sword fishing for 20 years, gave it up. You know, I was in my late 30s, thought it was time to go home, settle down, get married, have kids, and was very happy that I could still make my living uh, fishing, inshore lobstering. And, um, you know, 10 years went by. I always thought I'd like to go back sword fishing. The opportunity was never quite right. I either had 800 lobster traps in the water, so I couldn't drop everything and go yeah, sword fishing, yeah. or I was on a book tour and couldn't call the publicist and say, hey, I'm bailing out on you here. I, I'm going offshore. <laughs> I've heard the call. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so two years ago, I got a call, and I realized that the more time marched on and I didn't go back to my first love, which is sword fishing, uh, the more unlikely it was that I'd ever do it again. And you tell us very, very upfront. At least it seems that way to me, why you cannot resist. You say, the position of skipper aboard a U.S. Grand Bank's long line vessel is the absolute pinnacle of the fishing world. Why is that true? Well, I'll tell you what, I've been fishing since I was 19 years old and have been involved in many different fisheries on many different boats, but there's something about sword fishing, it's more exciting. The trips are a month long. We're a thousand miles from the dock. Swordfish are very elusive. It's a bigger challenge to catch them. Every trip is this like major adventure, and it can be a lot of fun. Um, it's just a fishing that I really enjoy, and being a captain on one of those boats. You know, in the perfect storms, George George Clooney has this soliloquy about being a sword boat captain, and it seems really corny, probably mm -hmm. to some people. But I'll tell you what, it gets me right in the heart when I hear him do it. <laughs> What does it mean? What does the phrase long line vessel mean? A long lining is the method of fishing that we use to catch swordfish. It's basically hook and line. Okay. Long line because we set one long string of line in the water at night, haul it back the next day, and on, onto this long string of line are attached uh, baited hooks. It's long lining. Okay. Now, when you decide to, to do this, in the, just in the answer to, to a phone call... <laughs> 
Yeah, okay, I'll do it. You've been out of the biz for about 10 years. Uh, you're, you know, in your 40s. And uh, you you start this all with a, with a question in your mind as to uh, whether whether you can still do it. Yes, whether, and actually whether going— Whether you've got it, I think you say. Uh, right, and I was well into my 40s. I was 47 when I, when I went back to sword fishing after a 10-year absence. And really the big question in my mind, which is, works so well with the title of the book, was whether or not I was still seaworthy. Uh-huh. And all my life, you know, seaworthy was perhaps the most complimentary adjective that I could attribute to anyone or, you know, strive to have attributed to me. And so, yeah, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, I was wondering at 47, when I was 19, I was told all I needed was a strong back and a weak mind to go fishing. And that combination suited the job to a T. But at 47 years old, going back, I wondered if what I'd gained in maturity would compensate for what had faded in youth. And at one point, uh, you finally feel comfortable on this on this voyage after you've blown up and screamed at the guys. Yeah, well, I guess I was kind of wondering if I still had that in me or if that had <laughs> faded in youth. And it was still there. It took a little more to, you know, set me off, but I still got there. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, the book is called Seaworthy, and it tells a thrilling story of Linda Greenlaw's return to the sea, and it tells another story as well. It tells us the story of the swordfish. You don't believe it? Stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster C-O-C. Or send an email to Jim Foster C-O-C at gmail.com. Seaworthy, that's the title of today's book, and you need to know the subtitle. A sword boat captain returns to the sea. That sword boat captain who wrote the book is Linda Greenlaw. The publisher is is Viking. And uh, the folks at Kirkus say in part, who can tire of sharks gnashing and thrashing around on a confined deck or the rhythmic beauty of laying out 30 miles of line baited with 800 hooks or heavy weather on a small boat in the big blue, 63 feet, 6 inches, if I recall correctly. No, no, 630 feet. Is that the size of your boat? 63 feet. 63 feet. That Relatively is, small for what we're that's doing. That's tiny. It is. That's tiny. Greenlaw speaks with unquestionable authority when fashioning the salty atmosphere of sword fishing life. Well, you sure do. So the 63 feet, that's considered small. A 30 miles of line baited with 800 hooks? Is that the way we sword fish? Yes, that's a very typical set. In fact, the bigger boats fish more line than that. Uh, we fish in sync with a lunar cycle, so we set this line every night, during, like, say, from the first quarter of the moon through the yeah. full moon into the last quarter. And, um, you know, hopefully get enough trip aboard, you know, in that one month span to, um, to go in and make some money. We're a long way from those two fat guys in the Florida Keys. You know that we're, <laughs> we're in a we're in a different place. It's it's, it's a different business. You 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 tell us at at one time at one place in the book that uh, you love swordfish, but when you when you say that you're not necessarily uh, talking about swordfish as a meal, although you surely do do enjoy it. The facts and figures surrounding swordfish, you write. Perhaps explain what makes them so worthy of my lifetime pursuit of them. The speed at which they travel, the distances they cover in their migration, and their strength all contribute to the quality most frequently attributed to them, elusiveness. What is their uh, migratory path? Well, the North Atlantic swordfish dock um, migrates all over the North Atlantic Ocean. They're down in the Caribbean when they spawn, and that's uh-huh. in the winter. That's and when the fat guys get them. That's when the fat guys get them. All right. Okay. And, uh, you know, where I have most of my experience is east of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, mm-hmm. and that's basically a summer and fall fishery. Okay. You go on to say each individual swordfish is an entity to be reckoned with. Now, that's born of being out there, you know, trying to catch them, I guess. Yeah. 
Not, I mean, this swordfish isn't exactly like that swordfish, I guess it comes down to. Huh? You know, I have come to believe that swordfish are just like people and there are no two alike. <laughs> okay. So long lining is not casting a net and hauling in whatever gets in the way. It's a plan of attack that targets fish one at a time. Patterns of behavior lead to numbers being caught, but still... There's a point in each fish's capture or release when it's a one-on-one fight. That's the romantic part. The most beautiful and stoic picture in the fishery is the image of one human finessing one fish until the fish is either dead or on, uh, is either dead on the deck or swimming away. That relationship is absolutely tentative. You love this job. <laughs> I really do. I I love the whole lifestyle. I like the feeling of being at sea. I am passionate about catching swordfish. And uh, it does always or almost always come down to a one-on-one deal? It does when you're fishing with hooks the way we do it. You know, people are always amazed. They think, oh, my God, 30 or 40 miles a line. Wow. And they think that's like big business. But actually, it's fishing with hooks. It's catching fish one at a time. It's the most primitive and elemental way to catch a fish. I mean, fishing is the oldest industry, perhaps with the exception of prostitution in the world. You <laughs> know, and catching fish with hooks is, is a pretty, pretty basic and old fashioned way yeah. to catch them. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of good writing in this book. And Thank you. I would like you to share uh, some of that with us. It, it's a. Uh, uh, I forget what it's about. Tell us what the background to what you're going to read is here. Well, I I think I'd like to read a short passage about the fish themselves and perhaps a little bit about my relationship with the fish. Do fish have the capacity to experience feelings of defeat or triumph? The belief that they do makes catching them that much more intense an experience. Who wants to engage in battle with a rock? I have in the past maintained that anthropomorphism is Greek to me. But it's, po- it's impossible to avoid attributing human characteristics, motivations, and qualities to a swordfish once you've encountered one eye to eye in its last gasp before succumbing, or once you've sensed the bravado and the slap of a tail of one fresh off the hook and diving for freedom. It's an egotistical world that I live in. It's a world that revolves around all I know and believe. Swordfish, among everything else, can be described and understood only in terms of me. Once I discovered that swordfish are monogamous, I perceived the partners of those dead-on hooks I'd hauled that followed their mates to the surface, allowing me to harpoon them as suicidal. We call them twofers and believe that the survivor of the hook just could not go on without its better half. We, according to our own lore, put the second fish out of its misery. As ridiculous as that sounds, if you haven't been there, you haven't been there. On the other end of the sword personality spectrum is the fish as a warrior. Xiphus gladius is the brave heart of the ocean. With few existing natural predators, swordfish through the ages have probably wiped out anything that could have been a threat. Their flat, double-edged bill is a built-in weapon, and nothing wields a weapon more quickly or with more dexterity than a swordfish. I've seen their samurai act firsthand. That's great. But enough about the fish. How about the crew, the voyage, the catch? And how did the author of Seaworthy land in jail? You've got questions, we've got answers. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. This is Conversations on the Coast. The title of our book today is Seaworthy, a swordfish. A sword boat captain <laughs> returns to the sea by Linda Greenlaw, published by Viking, and publishes weekly says in part from mishaps to fish tales. Greenlaw keeps the narrative suspenseful. Between bad luck and self doubt, she moves from experience to wisdom, guiding both crew and readers on a voyage of self affirmation. Somewhere in the book, I think. You you say you don't like to use the term bad luck. Well, I don't really believe in luck in terms of, you know, so many people voice their opinions to me that I've been lucky to have survived so uh-huh. many years at sea. And 
I always think, well, if I attribute my survival to luck, I'd also have to believe that someday my luck would run out, and I wouldn't dare go back offshore. Well, as you were uh, preparing to uh, uh, start this return, uh, what 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 would you? <laughs> What would you call what you got involved with? First of all, it's a rust bucket of a ship. Uh, it's It's been rebuilt, or at least the engine has been rebuilt. And uh, you, you you start going, and you have uh, some uh, unusual trouble, I would say. Not bad luck. The engine doesn't work after a while. The uh, steering goes kaflui. And uh, very uh, in, uh, the other important thing that goes totally wrong is the ice making. Now, we don't call that bad luck. <laughs> well, I, I guess, you know, uh, some of it's bad luck. But I knew I was getting into um, a bad situation when I first saw the Seahawk, the boat that I captained. Uh, she'd been dry docked for some time. Uh, all the systems, you know, you don't use it. They don't get better. They kind of go downhill fast. Yeah, yeah. So my crew and I had our hands full uh, keeping things together. And you said, well, what would I call this whole thing? Well, I do call it a 56-day epic disaster. <laughs> if this Very trip, good. Very good. If this good. trip had been my first I never would have made a second trip, Mm -hmm. but perhaps that's something that you gain in maturity. I've been on bad trips. I've had bad trips. It's part of the experience. This one was particularly bad, but you know what? We came through it. The topper of the misadventures, in in a way, I I think, uh, I think it would be for the readers at any rate, is uh, uh, being uh, uh, put in jail uh, by Canadian authorities. What did you do? Well, that um, arrest absolutely tops the list in my personal <laughs> experience, too, probably of my life of bad things that uh, that have happened. Um, I was caught um, in Canadian waters hauling my line. Uh, I made a very legal set, knowing that my gear was going to move away from Canada's 200-mile limit, mm-hmm. and I uh, was absolutely stunned when I was found inside or on the wrong side of the border. Um Long story short, I didn't find out until after my arrest and I was released from jail that a ship had run over my gear and towed it north over that line. Um, I'm sorry, what? uh, A deep draft ship, such as an oil tanker or something, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. had uh, crossed my line at some point. As we said, you know, I've got 30 or 40 miles of line in the water. I can't see one end to the other. So I'm hauling the line and uh, the captains work on deck during the day. No electronics on deck. They don't like salt water. And... I'm hauling along happily and kind of going through the motions of my first haul back in 10 years and was buzzed by a Canadian Coast Guard plane um, two or three times. I went up in the wheelhouse to see what was happening and immediately saw on the chart plotter that I was on the wrong side of the line. I was absolutely sick to my stomach, knew I was in big trouble, and I was arrested and taken to Newfoundland, handcuffed, put in jail. I was only in jail for 24 hours, or less than 24 hours, actually, but it seemed much longer than that. Um, I was released. I went back and stood trial several months later. No one's ever been acquitted of these charges. I was not to be the first. Uh, Paid a big fine, and, um, you know, life goes on. I'm glad it's behind me. Oh, wow. It's it's, it's so sad because uh, one of the other things that one gets from this book it is the amount of effort, the amount of devotion, the amount of, of physical work, the amount of teamwork that goes into fishing in, in, in this way, all of which you and your crew put into the job. And put the boom, it you know, blows up. Yeah, you um you hit it on the head. I mean we have our hearts and souls invested in, in every trip and we love what we do. And you're right, for whom it all blows up. Let's talk about some of the some of the crew. I, I think Dave uh, was a is kind of like a local friend of yours. That yes, you, Dave Hiltz is a friend you, of mine you from the island. Convinced to leave his lobster traps and go on this adventure. It didn't take much convincing. <laughs> I mean, for years, Dave Hiltz had said, "If you ever go back sword fishing, I'm going with you." So I mean, it was basically a phone call, and it was a yes right away. And his uh, own misadventure, his personal misadventure, involved his almost being electrocuted. Yes, he got a really, really bad zapping. Uh, I was very worried about it. Had a satellite phone, called a doctor. And, uh, you know, he's fine. 
Uh, the next day, he felt like he'd been run over by a truck. He was very sore. Um, and it was, you know, I don't know how close the call it was. Um, but how would you know? You're in the middle of the ocean. And that's the other thing. There's, there's so much need for teamwork and self-reliance out there. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, obviously no medical facility um, yeah. nearby. So we, we really do. We have to take care of ourselves and each other and, you know, hope for the best. If there's a hero in the store besides yourself, I think it's Archie. Uh, absolutely, hands down. Archie is my hero. He's um, the best guy on a boat I've ever had, just a totally optimistic, taking care of everyone, uh, you know. And a very good engineer. Excellent engineer. Just yeah. good at everything. The man is just good. Well, this is a very, very good book. And you're going to love Archie. You're going to love all the characters in this book. And you're going to go crazy for the adventure of Seaworthy by Linda Greenlaw. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.